Okay, I'm S.A. Hale. My wife is Terry in the back. Don't trust her. She's the one that looks like, you know, a little gray hair and all that. So that's the ones you got to watch out for. The other ones you got to watch out for are the ones in suits. You all know that. So that's why I wore my feet with bow ties. You're right. And suspenders. You know, so. Uh, are those pirate anyway, suspenders? Huh? Are those pirate suspenders? Yes. It's all on crossbones. I know who I am. Okay? So, what we're going to talk about tonight is cognitive biases. And this is a whole area in psychology that's been studied uh, by a lot of people. And I have several videos to show you to, to emphasize some of the points that we're going to be talking about. Now, a lot of times people look at me and go, well, what does psychology have to do with computers? Well, everything, because we still have humans connected to the computers. For the time being. Yes. And I like the way you think. And so, the problem is us. We are the problem. And what we're going to look at, and I've got to find a place to pace. I'm also a college professor. So I pace, okay? That's what we do. I, I also uh, have about nine classified labs that are mine that, uh, at a company I work for. And so I'm in heavily involved in the classified world. And so I won't be giving you exact examples. I've already had a sit-down talk this week with counterintelligence. I don't want to know. Okay? No, it wasn't anything bad. It's just that you don't want them coming by, you know? Was that with the FBI or your own case? No, it wasn't the FBI. It was another group. There's a bunch of them out there. Yeah, FBI. You know, they're all clean cut looking too. Uh, so what we're going to do is talk about your brain. And in particular, how your brain works and what it does. It does tricks. It does shortcuts. This helps us solve problems quickly. These are called heuristics or cognitive biases. And they lead to us making predictable mistakes. And this is the part that, depending on what side of the room you're on, if you're on the, I'm going to call you all the hacker side. If you're on the hacker side, then you want to know what those mistakes are so you can use them against the human. Okay? <laughs> then, the defensive side of the room, y'all need to know them so that when you're developing security, you know how mistakes will happen and how to correct them and how to do procedures and protocols to help in those situations. So, my question is, does your brain lie to you? Does it filter reality? A hundred and ten different ways it does that. They've identified roughly a hundred and ten cognitive biases. Is that like when you believe that magnets will heal you or that vaccinations are bad? No. Something, yes, and, uh, yes, it can be because when you're doing something like that, you will find all the research that will support your belief. Okay, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but that confirmational biases are there. You will find the research to support you. And you will ignore everybody on this side of the room who have facts and statistics to prove that you're wrong. You won't believe them. So it's that ingrained into us. I need a volunteer. One volunteer. Come on. Somebody volunteer. Okay, stand up. Watch the screen. It won't hurt much, okay? Electrocutor. Oh, okay. <laughs> Say the color, not the word. Blue, green, orange, purple, red, blue, orange, green, yellow, purple, black, blue, green, black. Very, very good. Now, don't leave. Part two. Say the color. Green, purple, blue, yellow, purple, red, yellow, blue, 
green, orange, black, green, purple, green, purple, purple, orange, red, black. Now, was it more difficult the second time? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. What happens, and of course I would pick the one person to do it, I can't do it. I sit there and go, uh, 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 uh. yeah. But what happens is most of the time we're so prone to say red is red that when it appears as green or black or something, we won't say that. We'll say red. But that's part of it. You did real well. We're very good. You pay attention. That's that's what we can't do. We can't have that. You know. Okay. So cognitive biases are inherent thinking errors that we have in processing information. These thinking errors prevent us from understanding reality. We're going to dive a little bit deeper into this. And our cognitive biases, they come about from our evolutionary history. Boy, if we was in England, I would say evolutionary. Okay, but they're there. What they help us with is concrete day-to-day -day problems. Think you're on the savannah, and you, you know, you're hunting for your meal, and you see rustling in the grass. What do you do? Using your system one level, you run to the nearest tree. Using system two, you go, hey, I wonder what that is. Oh, I'm suffering. You know, system one helped us for millions and millions of years. So <clears throat> when we talk about cognitive biases, we are talking about helping us analyze the human factor of all the puzzles for doing security and intelligent work. This is six of 23 of them, okay? There's a whole bunch of them out there. But they really help us in understanding InfoSec, HumanSec, PsyOps, you know, all of those parts. Anytime you think, you know, there's a human involved, physical security. You see in physical security when you sit down and you start mapping out how a perimeter should be done and people go, well, why are we doing that? Well, we've never had any problems. Why do we need a fence? Why do we need guards? Why do we need locks on the doors? You know, we've never had a problem. Well, how many times do you need to have a problem before it's, a, you know, for what ideally in national security? You know, so. So, yes, cognitive bias touches everything, and you see it when you're working with, with people, uh, users of the systems, managers, uh, you know, company owners. You see it every time you start trying to do security. But for us, we want to talk about social engineering, the fun part. So, we're talking people hacking here, and we're looking at how do we manipulate people into performing actions or divulging information they normally would not do? Now, <clears throat> how many of y'all know somebody who is a magician? Any of y'all? Okay, is he a professional or really good? A good amateur. Okay. One of the things you'll notice about them, one of the things I say is find a, a good magician. Let him teach you some of his skills. Okay? One of the first things they do is they get people to gather up around him, closer, closer, closer around him. And then he does like a card trick. You sitting over there will see what's going on. But right here, your focus is on him. Your eyes are divided into high def and low def. And your only 5% of your eye is high def. So I'm sitting here and I'm looking at the gentleman in the back and I have him in focus. I can see y'all, but I can't see y'all. I can see you, but I can't see you. I can't. And one of the best experiments we, we watched, Carrie and I did, was a guy took a cheerleader and put a, she was holding a big X, brought in a guy and <clears throat> he stood and looked right at the big X she was holding. 
closed his eyes, they brought in two other cheerleaders. Open your eyes for one second, close your eyes. Which one was more attractive? They picked the guy who was dressed like a girl. And they had facial hair. You know? So it's because when he was staring right at that X, this was fuzzy. And you couldn't see it. Now think about using that in doing social engineering when you work as a group on somebody. This is a test of selective attention. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. The correct answer is 15 passes. And a gorilla. But did you see the gorilla? How many saw the gorilla? How many have seen this before? Okay. It helps if you've seen it before. Of the people this video never is from research by Daniel Simon and Christopher Shabri and is copyrighted. They don't see the gorilla. How do you miss a gorilla? You know? <laughs> you know? Yeah, and usually the best way to do this is, again, you have the people sitting here. You know, right square on. The more on the fringes you are, the better you'll see the gorilla. It's just the way our minds work. So in this, what I mentioned earlier was the system one and the system two. System two is slower, okay? But it's, it's mainly meant for a higher order skills. Now watch this, this is interesting. Watch the people. the people walking on the edge on the white strip like if that glass broke that's going to help you in at all <laughs> but that's what our brain has been conditioned to numerous numerous research have been done especially in the early uh, 30s and 40s of taking infants who were crawling and they'd have them crawl across the floor and then hit a glass area the infants would stop even as infants they knew something's wrong right there and wouldn't go across. So it's part, we're, we're hardwired for a lot of our stuff, okay? So we really don't know what is causing this. We just know that it is neuroscience is supporting the system one versus system two. And they call into collision with one another, creating our cognitive bias. So we divided the group of cognitive biases into three groups, sorry, into three groups. And I just read a report last week out of England where uh, they divided into four groups. Okay, someone has to be different. But anyway, what we're doing is this whole area of decision making, there's a whole field of called behavioral economics that looks into how do we make decisions? Why do we make decisions? And then they take that into how do we market to you so that you will make the right decision, which is to buy our stuff. You know? <laughs> so there's a whole field there that's learning how to use that. So one of the things in looking at this and then applying it to security is you can't just look at one world. 
you got to look at what other professions are doing. The social uh, biases are more the actor versus observer world. Um, how many of you have seen a, uh, maybe on a show or somewhere there's an accident and the police interviews the two people involved, then they interview the witness, and then the police will compare notes and say something like, were those people even here? Because their story is totally different. That's the problem in like a courtroom when you have witnesses coming up in a courtroom and the story they tell is just totally wrong. And they, you know, they get ripped apart by the lawyers, of course, that's what they're good at. But they, they see things from their viewpoint. Again, that can be very helpful to us because we have one person who is the actor interacting with the target and then we have observers to see what's going on so that they can now give feedback to the actor of what he needs to do, how he needs to handle that person. Have you ever been to a county fair and you've seen somebody walking around, they got some sweet little honey on, on his arm, you know, and she's skimpily dressed because that will get you attention, and they're carrying some big stuffed animal around. Do they really win that animal? Or do they work for the carnival? Social engineering is everywhere. So anyway, looking at decision by, uh, biases, we'll look at anchoring, which we tend to, to anchor on a trait or a decision. And I have a video on anchoring that I think you might like. Then, looking at the bandwagon effect, used to, in elections, presidential type elections, when the polls closed on the East Coast, the Eastern Time Zone, they would report who won. And then they report on the Central. Well, by the time they got to the mountain in the Pacific, they started knowing, noticing something. Whoever was in the lead became more in the lead as the polls closed, and more into the lead bandwagon. Everybody wants to be supporting a winner. So they jump on that bandwagon. Football season. We all probably know people who are football fans, okay? So, I mean, I like Man Manchester United myself, but different football. But anyway, if, if the football team is doing really, really well, you'll see more people wearing the jerseys of that team. If they're not doing real well, it's only the diehards or the ones that only have that that's clean, you know, who are wearing the, the jersey. So you see this bandwagon effect. Now, think about how you could use that. You get people on the bandwagon, you know, supporting the right idea. The, uh, the blind spot bias is really cool because we all see ourselves as being less biased than that other group over there. A confirmational bias I already talked about how you will find information to support your beliefs, no matter what they are, you know, and that's one of the problems of doing research papers is you find what supports you and then you hand them into the professor and he goes, ha ha, wrong, you know. <laughs> so overconfident bias, I love this one because we see it every Wednesday night, my wife and I, uh, do trivia with another uh, couples and we ask, are you sure about this one? Well, if one of us goes, well, we're 99% sure, that means we're wrong 40% of the time. So. <laughs> My name is Laurie Santos. I teach psychology at Yale University. And today, I want to talk to you about anchoring. This lecture is part of a series on cognitive biases. Let's do a math problem really quickly. And you've got to do it in your head. Ready? First, multiply the following numbers. 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. OK, that's it. Okay, what did you get? 
I don't know. I like that one. That one's neat. Just shout out a number. What do you think? 81. Over 9,000. Over 9,000. <laughs> Eight factorials. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. I can get it to come back to life now. Can I get No, okay. Well, the door study. No. <laughs> Not yet. My name is Lori Santos. I teach psychology at Yale University, and today I want to talk to you about anchoring. This lecture is part of a series on cognitive biases. Let's do a math problem really quickly, and you've got to do it in your head. Ready? First, multiply the following numbers. 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Okay, that's it. What's your guess? A thousand? Two thousand? When the psychologists Danny Kahneman and Amos Tversky tried this with human subjects, subjects on average guessed about 2,250. Seems like an okay guess. But now, let's suppose I gave you a different math problem. What if I gave you this one? Ready? One times two times three times four times five times six times seven times eight. What's your answer? Anybody? If you're like Kahneman and Tversky's subjects, 40, your answer might be a bit different here. For this question, their subjects guessed a lot lower. On average, they said the answer was about 512. The first amazing thing about these similar mathematical estimates is that people get the answers really, really wrong. In fact, the real answer? Well, for both, it's 40,320. People are off by it in order of magnitude. But the second, even more amazing thing is that people give different answers to the two problems, even though they're just different ways of asking exactly the same question. Why do we give completely different answers when the same math problem is presented differently? The answer lies in how we make estimates. When you have lots of time to do a math problem, like eight times seven times six times five times four times three times two times one, you can multiply all of the numbers together and get an exact product. But when you have to do the problem quickly, you don't really have time to finish. So you start with the first numbers, you multiply eight times seven and get 56, and then you've gotta multiply that by six, and well, you're guessing the final number's gotta be pretty big, bigger than 56, like maybe 2,000 or so. But when you do the second problem, you start with one times two, and well, that's only two, and two times three is only six. Your answer is gonna be pretty small, maybe only like 500 or so. This process of guessing based on the first number you see is what's known as anchoring. The first number we think of when we do our estimate is the anchor. And once we have an anchor in our head, well, we sort of adjust as needed from there. The problem is that our minds are biased not to adjust as much as we need to. The anchors are cognitively really strong. In the first problem, you probably started with 56 and then adjusted to an even bigger number from there. And in the second problem, you started with six and then adjusted from there. The problem is that starting at different points leads to different final guesses. Like real anchors, our estimated anchors kind of get us stuck in one spot. We often fail to drag the anchor far enough to get to a correct answer. Kahneman and Tversky discovered that this sort of anchoring bias happens all the time, even for anchors that are totally arbitrary. For example, they asked people to spin a wheel with numbers from 1 to 100, and then asked them to estimate what percentage of countries in the United Nations are African. People who spun a 10 on the wheel estimated that the number was about 25%. But people who spun a 65 estimated that the number was 45%. In another experiment, Dan Ariely and his colleagues had people write down the last two digits of their social security number. They were then asked whether they would pay that amount in dollars for a nice bottle of wine. Ariely and colleagues found that people in the highest quintile of social security numbers would pay three to four times as much for the exact same good. Just setting up a larger anchor can make a person who would pay $8 for the bottle of wine be willing to spend $27 instead. Sadly for us, salespeople use anchors against us all the time. How many times have you noticed a salesperson or an advertisement anchoring you to a particular price or even to how much of a particular product you should buy? 
whether it's buying a car or a sweater or even renting a hotel room, our intuitions about what prices are reasonable to pay often come from some arbitrary anchor. So the next time you're given an anchor, take a minute to think. Remember what happens when you drop your anchor too high, and then consider thinking of a very different number. It might affect your final estimate more than you expect. So the whole thing with, with anchoring is it's used against us all the time. It takes advantage of our cognitive biases. Now, again, we can see how what happens when I like make a quote and you know it will cost twenty thousand dollars to secure this room. Well that becomes the quote. If we do further analysis and come back with no it was really twenty five thousand. Oh no 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 it has to be twenty. You know, you said it was twenty. So they get stuck on that. You know, so always make high quotes. You know? <laughs> The door study. This video shows a participant from a 1998 study by Daniel Simons and Daniel Levin. Watch what happens as the unsuspecting pedestrian provides directions. The young man on the left is one of the experimenters. He has approached the white haired man and asked for directions. Watch closely as two people carrying a door pass between them, and the first experimenter is replaced by someone else. <laughs> like many of the people in this study, the pedestrian was entirely unaware that he was talking to a different person. Approximately 50% of the people approached in this study didn't notice when the person they were talking to was replaced by someone else. Ever heard about piggybacking into a classified area? <laughs> Do it all the time. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> the thing is, is that's how you can get away with it. I remember in college, I mean, I had my hair down on my shoulders, and, you know, I had hair back then believe it or not, and down on my shoulders, you know, and I had a, a, a mustache, and two of my friends who were also professors, they were talking about places they were going to as sociologists and visiting, and my friend and I, who is, Ricky is still a friend of mine, uh, even now, um, he had long hair too, and we went, oh wow, it'd be fascinating, we'd love to go, and they went, you can't go, you won't fit in. <coughs> Long hair, facial hair, no, won't happen. Because both of these guys were fairly clean cut, okay? One of them happened to be a captain in intelligence, but you know. And so you have to, to fit in. You have to look the part of where you're at. Now look around the room. Do I fit in? I have a coat and tie. No, I don't fit in. You know, with a coat and tie, I did that on purpose as one of my demonstrations. Another one is they did a, a, at a table like this, it was a long counter, person brought up their forms for a psychology study. They gave it to it, the guy ducked down behind the table to get another form and out popped another guy wearing a different shirt, different hair color, everything. The test was when they left and went in the room was, did you notice? And they went, notice what? Again, more than 50% of them never notice they're that far apart from each other think about how you can use that so looking at the social uh, biases again we're looking at the the actor the observer in particular uh, looking at how uh, people who uh, and you'll see some of these several different spoken several different ways is that a lot of people who are incompetent don't know they are you know so use that to your advantage. Uh, you have to practice these skills. Uh, we have a tendency to, to defend the status quo. Well, that's the way granddaddy did it, so it's good enough for me. Uh-oh. You know, yeah. 
<laughs> and, you know, which I'm not sure what my granddad did with a computer, but you know, no. uh, the thing is, the the status quo bias we get in our minds that we've been doing, we've been using XP for ten years. <laughs> What's wrong with XP? <laughs> yeah, oh, it's never been hacked. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. So, so the status quo <laughs> bias gets us every time. I have a couple of examples. Status quo bias is um, shown in lots of different ways, particularly in the sort of buy and hold strategy. The problem is, is you convince yourself of a particular view of the world, and then if data comes in that changes your view, you are quite reluctant to change the initial view. Status quo bias is often what, you know, what leads to the buy and hold strategy. It's one of the reasons why so many bears on the Eurozone were so reluctant to change their minds. Because intellectually, they've convinced themselves of a particular position on, in the world, so to be bearish on the Eurozone. And then when new data comes in that maybe challenges that view, they don't want to admit that they've been wrong or that the world has changed. And therefore, they stick to the, that their original view no matter what happens. And that is sort of like an emotional attachment to your original view. Now, that can be very dangerous and is a classic reason why, you know, individuals miss stocks that turn, uh, miss, you know, collapses. It, it, it often the big picture, you miss the big picture because you're unwilling to change your attachment to that view. Um, as Keynes once said, you know, when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? And I think that that sums it up perfectly. Status quo bias. So, again, I'm pulling something out of the financial world because so many people got caught by not changing in there. They were stuck. They had their, their, their status quo was they're making money, they're going to continue to make money. They made money for 10 years. The only people who made money who looked at the trends and went, huh, it's about to go south here, and they jumped. They made lots of money. Same thing happens in security. You see things that are, that are trending before they trend. One of the papers that uh, working on is I'm working on a cognitive overload paper also, how to overload the, the user of the computer so you can sneak in. But another one is looking using data science in doing predictive threat analysis on the amount of data coming in because nowadays medium-sized systems are getting five gigs worth of data a day to analyze. Bigger systems are getting, you know, terabytes worth of data and it's just too much. You can't keep up. So we've got to have the new tools of data science. But you've got people who are going, well, no, we don't need to change. We've been doing it this way for 10 years, five years. In this world, two years is a long time, you know. So here's another one. We make choices every day of our lives. Will I have toast or cereal for breakfast? Which route do I take to work today? A common assumption is that we make decisions based on our preferences. I like toast better than cereal, so that's what I'm going to have. We choose what we think will give us the greatest happiness, but what we decide is frequently influenced by seemingly trivial external or contextual factors. To demonstrate one such factor, we ran a live experiment at one of our School of Psychology open days. Visitors to the open day were invited to participate in a short experiment on decision making and motor skill. We set up a carnival style booth with a ball throwing task. Volunteers had to try and throw a juggling ball into a pot from a two meter distance. To entice them to participate, we offered a chocolate reward if they scored. We told them that they could either throw with their dominant hand and win one chocolate bar or throw with their non-dominant hand and win two chocolate bars. In economics terms, we therefore presented our volunteers with a choice between a low risk, low reward option, the dominant hand, and a high risk, high reward option, the non-dominant hand. But here's a twist. We randomly divided our participants into two groups or conditions. One group of participants were presented with the low risk, low reward option as the default, and the other with the high risk, high reward option as the default. The instructions for both groups were explained in a short video that participants watched before entering the throwing booth. 
Once they had heard the instructions, participants had to pick up a ball with either their dominant or non-dominant hand, depending on condition, and walk into the booth to take their throw. Before throwing, they were given a final choice. Stay with whatever the default option was, or switch to the other hand. The question was whether people would make their decision based purely on a judgment of risk and reward, or whether the way the options were presented or framed would have an impact. Let's see what happened. If participants decided which hand to throw with, based purely on a trade-off between risk and reward, we would expect that the high and low risk options would be chosen equally often in both groups. Well, that's not what we found. 191 people participated in total. Of the 98 people who walked in with the ball in their dominant hand, 75% stuck with that and did not choose to switch. Similarly, of the 93 people who walked in with the ball in their non-dominant hand, the majority, 62%, stuck with that and did not switch. So what happened? People tended to stay with whatever the default option was that had been presented to them. This is known as the status quo effect. People take the current position as their reference and evaluate decisions from that vantage point. So our volunteers didn't decide whether to throw with their dominant or non-dominant hand. Instead, they decided whether to give up one opportunity in exchange for another. People are reluctant to give up what they already have. This behavior fits with what we know from cognitive psychology about people assessing losses and gains differently. The potential loss associated with moving away from the default position was perceived as greater than the potential gain of switching to the other option. And that was true regardless of what the default option actually was. Utility companies, banks and insurance providers can exploit this effect to their advantage. The way choices are presented to people, including the options which are marked as default, can have an enormous impact on the decisions people make. Another real-world example of the status quo bias is how options concerning organ donation are conveyed. Whether being a donor is presented as the default dramatically influences uptake rates. Do you know what the worst... They were afraid that it wouldn't, wouldn't be a good way all the chocolate. It's like, come on, you're in college. <laughs> you know, live on that stuff. The, the point here is, notice it's the way you present the options to people. That's the key. So when you're doing and talking, whether it's in email or doing spear phishing or welling or whether it's in face to face, it's how you present them with options will make the big difference. So in memory biases, a uh, self-serving bias is, is a good one. Uh, I was blaming my clicker, you know, because it misfunctioned, not myself. Okay, see, bias is everywhere. So anyway, the Google effect I like because we have a tendency to forget stuff because we can find it online. Einstein said that about books when they were asking him about math formulas. He went, why I have a book? You know, with that in there. So then, um, let's see, uh, we also tend to call the past history differently that helps us uh, better. The self-serving bias describes the tendency of people to attribute success to themselves and failure to outside factors. In other words, if it worked, it's because of me. If it didn't, it's because of someone or something else. It's a common type of cognitive bias that has been studied extensively in social psychology. For example, if 
a person passes her driving test on the first try, she says that it was because she studied hard and she is a good driver. But if she fails, she blames the examiner, the car, the weather, or anything but her bad driving skills. Studies show that the self-serving bias happens in many different situations of our daily lives, at school, at the workplace, in relationships, sports, and even when we decide what to shop. Researchers think that it helps protect our self-esteem and reduces hurtful emotions we can't control. Self-control, culture, and emotion all play a role, and we even use it to protect others when we say, it wasn't your fault, there's nothing you could have done. It sounds innocent, but the self-serving bias can have a great impact on our life because we don't learn from our mistakes and that we can do something for years without getting better at it. If the driving student admits that she failed because she didn't practice enough, she could ask people for help, study harder, and pass the test on the second try. After all, you can only influence your own actions and not those of others or your environment. So here are some tips that can help you avoid the pitfalls of self-serving bias. Get started by observing yourself and notice when you're doing it. Then ask yourself, why are you doing it and does it help you move forward? Try to imagine how your future looks if you use the self-serving bias a lot and what happens if you accept your failures or look at things that help you succeed. Try not to think about the causes of problems too much without moving forward and trying to solve them. When we dwell on the past, our mind looks for excuses which starts the self-serving bias. Recognize when something is your own fault and learn to forgive yourself. Everybody makes mistakes, but only the people who understand when they did something wrong can learn and grow. This social innovation video was sponsored and created by Minute... Hindsight Bites. It's crystal clear after the game what should have been done or after the droids leave. So, and the, the self-serving bias is real common and also watch your target. I used to fly a lot out in West Texas and I would attend monthly meetings and what we would do part of those meetings is talk about crashes. What went wrong? How did it go wrong? Usually it was pilot did something wrong, forgot to take the pitot tube uh, cover. Saw, cover off of the thing. Uh, it, that's where the airspeed indicator is. So, you, so as you're practicing social engineering, step back and go, okay, what did I do right? What did I do wrong? Have a wingman with you, okay? So they can step back and watch and tell you what you did wrong. It'd be very helpful. So, if we don't have a category for something, we ignore it. We did this with Pearl Harbor. We had no category for airplanes sinking battleships, even though Billy Mitchell proved that it was could happen. We court-martialed him. And so, everybody said it could not happen. Even when they picked up the formation on radar, they went, nope, 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 those are the bombers coming in from the United States. They're coming from the wrong direction. You know, we ignored it. So we are doing the same thing, of course, in a lot of security areas. We are ignoring it because we don't have a category for that particular security problem. It's new, it's different, we ignore it. We tend to discount facts that do not support our analysis. Uh, we overstate uh, conclusions when uh, little data is consistent. We'll grab at straws, in other words. We uh, change our analysis. To, to, uh, we do not change our analysis despite mounting uh, conclusions to the opposite. We just won't change. And we, are, we assume the present will be just like the past. Now, in this group of people, we all know that's not true. But when you leave this room and you go to the, to the real world, they think it's just going to be the same old, same old. So how do, you, how do we in, uh, fight 
cognitive bias. Well, that old thing we learned in high school, scientific method, really works. Because what it does is it makes us stop and look at what's going on with uh, a particular situation, makes us do analysis of it. Another way to do things is do case studies, like I was talking about with the airplanes and the crashes. Uh, review our past performance. Change the people in your group. Have fresh people come in. One of the things I learned a long time ago in doing engineering problems is have a group of males and females. Mix them up. The females come up with the answer differently than the males do. It may be the right way to do it. But we'd never know that if it's just a group of guys. So always have a mixture. Have people from different disciplines. Not everybody has to be a computer science or engineer or physicist. You know, bring psych people in there. You know, bring marketing people in there. Bring business people. All of a sudden, they may have the answer that you would well, that can't happen. But it does. Um, change the group. Check your assumptions, okay? We always make these big assumptions. <laughs> Hi, I'm Richard, this is Sarah, and we're going to perform the amazing color-changing card trick with this blue-backed deck of cards. Now the idea is very simple. I'm just going to spread the cards in front of Sarah and ask her to push any card towards the camera. Right, okay, let's see. I'm going to go for this card here. Okay. Now Sarah could have selected any card at all from the deck. But she selected the card, which is now face down on the table. What I'm going to ask her to do is show us which card she selected. Right, so the card that I chose was in fact the Three of Diamonds. The Three of Diamonds, okay, an excellent choice. That card goes back into the deck. Now I'm just going to spread the cards face up on the table. Give a little click of the fingers. And you'll see that Sarah's card here has now got a blue back. Not particularly surprising, what's slightly more surprising is all of the other cards have got red backs. And that is the amazing color changing card trick. the amazing color changing card trick with this blue backed deck of cards. Now the idea is very simple. I'm just going to spread the cards in front of Sarah and ask her to push any card towards the camera. Right, okay, let's see. I'm going to go for this card here. Okay. Now Sarah could have selected any card at all from the deck, but she selected the card which is now face down on the table. What I'm going to ask her to do is show us which card she selected. Right, so the card that I chose was in fact the Three of Diamonds. The Three of Diamonds, okay, yeah, excellent yeah. choice. That card goes back into the deck. Now I'm just going to spread the cards face up on the table. Give a little click of the fingers. And you'll see that Sarah's card here has now got a blue back. Not particularly surprising, what's slightly more surprising is all of the other cards have got red backs. And that is the amazing color changing card trick. Don't believe everything you think. <laughs> Terry's telling me I'm running out of time, so. Understanding cognitive bias can offer protection. Understanding cognitive biases can offer opportunity. Just depends on which side you're on. Our simple summary. We have all these routers, firewalls, encryption. We have what, 14 letter passwords that move into 24 letter passwords. And then we have Dave. <laughs> Dave's my target.
<laughs> okay, any questions? Oh, good. Uh, no. <laughs> If uh, any of you are interested in an undergraduate degree, Athens State in Alabama offers one online with a concentration in security. My plug for the school. Okay, thank you.